Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of Lewisburg, West Virginia. We'll start with the history of Lewisburg and the Fallout universe, and then move on to the history of the real world city found in Greenbrier County, West Virginia. In the Fallout universe, Lewisburg, West Virginia lies at the northeastern edge of the mining country that became known as the Ash Heap. The city is laid out in a grid off in game Highway 83, mirroring the real world Highway 60. In both the real and in game worlds, the highway is referred to locally as Washington Street. The major cross streets in the game, also mirroring real world streets, are Court Street and Church Street, although in the real world, Church Street is south of Washington rather than north. The town is host to 12 houses, apartment buildings, offices, shops, a restaurant, a cafe, a visitor center, a tourist center, a church, and a train station. There is a structure that very closely mimics the real world local Carnegie Hall at the north end of town. The city shows clear signs of a street fair, the Spring Garden Festival, and the pre-war election. Just north lies the Pleasant Hill Cemetery. To the southeast, there is a bot stop that the Enclave has commandeered. To the south, you can find Lake Reynolds and the attached fairgrounds that mimic the real-world Lake Shawnee Amusement Park, although that site is some 47 miles southwest in the real world. Just to the southwest, there is what appears to be a large pipe sculpture. To the northwest of the city, you can find a Hornwright Industrial Air Purifier. To the northeast lies Uncanny Caverns, mimicking the real-world Lost World caverns that underlie the area just northwest of the real-world city. Lastly, to the east you can find the western terminal of the Big Bend Tunnel, linking Lewisburg to Watoga and the Cranberry Bog beyond. In the years before the bombs, Lewisburg had a strong culture. The city was known for its festivals and in 2061 was voted coolest small town USA. To deal with the sometimes toxically polluted air caused by the local mining, the citizens of Lewisburg planted gardens on the roofs of the town. In the early 2070s, Van Lowe Taxidermy hosted the Truth Seekers Club, headed by local resident Calvin Van Lowe, that sought the elusive Sheep Squatch. Calvin traveled off to school at VTU in the fall of 2072, abandoning his past pursuits and leaving his sister Shelly to run the taxidermy shop. Appalachia, in both the real world and the Fallout universe, has been host of the mining industry for centuries. In both cases, the vast number of miners required to extract the coal and ore from the region were made more and more efficient by machines, and then replaced to them to a certain extent. More and more coal was extracted by fewer and fewer workers. In the Fallout universe, Hornwright Industrial, working in concert with Atomic Mining Services, developed the Autominer. This Protectron variant was capable of replacing the remaining human workers in Hornwright's mines, leading to greater unemployment across the region, as the miner jobs were effectively halved. Garahan Mining Company was resolved to keep humans in the process, and thus they developed the Excavator Power Armor suit to give humans an edge. So confident was CEO Vivian Garahan of her company's suit that she publicly announced the Man vs. Machine Challenge of excavator-suited miners competing with Hornwright's auto miners. Though the date of this event is in dispute, the location appears to have been Lewisburg. After Hornwright won the event by cheating, Garahan Mining was forced to lease auto miners to keep up with Hornwright. As more jobs were lost, worker anger rose. On October 1st, 2077, an event took place in nearby Welch, West Virginia that caused local workers to go into a full-scale riot against automation and the mining companies of Appalachia. Lewisburg was not as heavily involved in the mining industry as their neighboring cities in the region, and thus they were not as affected by the job losses, but the riot spread to the city nonetheless and barricades went up. On October 3, 2077, rioting miners took down a mega mansion in Bromwell and Governor Evans called out the National Guard. Within weeks, the situation around Lewisburg was calm, though fighting continued elsewhere. When Calvin Van Lowe finished his studies at VTU, he went to work for the Baishi Company, a natural gas producer. Baishi wanted control of the west end of Lewisburg as a source of natural gas, but they didn't really want to pay market prices, and thus, they worked out a Scooby-Doo villain-esque scheme. Calvin Van Lowe was hired to scare the landowners off with a robotic sheep squatch. Working in a secret lab below Van Lowe taxidermy, he created a fake sheep squatch with a standard Assaultron. After orchestrating a pair of sightings of his modified Assaultron that bore no fruit, he got his hands on a top-of-the-line Assaultron and began refitting and reprogramming it immediately. Unfortunately for Mr. Van Lowe, he developed amorous feelings for the form of the Assaultron he was refitting. Sometime between October 17th and 18th of 2077, when attempting to reprogram the machine to help him fulfill his desires, he accidentally turned it into an uncontrollable killing machine that beat him to death before escaping the confines of the basement. Mr. Wolf, a Baishi Company fixer, was dispatched to track him down after he missed checking in. In the backyard of a nearby home, Wolf was seen snooping by the Lewisburg police. To avoid entanglement with the local law enforcement, Wolf killed the two policemen. After discovering the state of Van Lowe taxidermy and the situation with the imposter Sheep Squatch, Wolf traveled to the Garahan estate in Bromwell to get his hands on some tech to take the robot down. The R&D department at Garahan Mining had developed anti-robot equipment, but Vivian Garahan had not been happy how dangerous it was to operate, shocking the user in the process. She had given the task of managing this equipment to her destitute, couch-surfing nephew Alan Garahan. Alan, in turn, sold this equipment to Mr. Wolf. 
Wolf took the equipment and traveled to an ambush site northwest of Lewisburg. Though we don't know for certain the outcome of this encounter, the imposter Sheep Squatch still terrorizes Appalachia in 2102, and Mr. Wolf's hat can potentially drop from the imposter Sheep Squatch's body when it's taken down. Calvin's sister returned home October 19th, 2077, and when she didn't get a response, she beat down the door to his office. But she couldn't find him. Distraught and out of answers, she posted the Sheep Squatch Ate My Brother posters across the area, but was unable to discover anything more. She eventually left town to travel to, quote, where mom and dad said we'd always live someday, unquote. When the bombs came down October 23rd, 2077, the people of Lewisburg took shelter and waited out the nuclear winter of 2077 to 2078. After the winter passed, they tried to get back to their lives as they had been before. The barricades originally set up by the anti-automation protesters likely became defenses after the war, but otherwise the goal appears to have been simple continuity. It seems that they were so sure that things would eventually return to normal that they didn't even bother to take down the automated voting stations for the election that was cancelled when the bombs came down. It was this desire to remain unchanged by the war that would be the end of Lewisburg. The streets were filled with tents and stalls for the annual Spring Garden Festival. The people were celebrating with a street fair that included shopping, food, and live music. Stalls hosted booksellers, antiques dealers, florists, and in one case, the Clarksburg Shooting Range. As a side note, it's my belief that the original proprietor of the Clarksburg Shooting Range in the northern West Virginia city of Clarksburg fled the increasingly toxic Toxic Valley to set up in Lewisburg after the war. As the festivities were underway, raiders from Pleasant Valley Ski Resort entered the town and snuck onto the unguarded rooftops. Once the raiders were done with their monstrous work, the town lay abandoned for some time. The Pleasant Hills Cemetery was thoroughly looted. The responders would eventually arrive to create an outpost in the Lewisburg train station, leaving a vendor bot in the ticket booth. In 2086, as Olivia Rivers was in the process of undermining her mother, father, and sister mistresses of mystery, she sold out Mistress Natasha Hunt to her boyfriend and Pleasant Valley Raider, Brody Torrance. When she arrived in town, Mistress Natasha was ambushed by a half dozen raiders led by Brody's lieutenant, Carrie. She managed to take out three of the raiders before she was finally brought down. The mistresses would be gone within the year. While the responders and the raiders fought it out over the course of the next decade, east of the mountains, the Brotherhood of Steel was dealing with a rising threat of the Scorched. When the Brotherhood fell in August of 2095, the Scorched began to move through Big Bend Tunnel. The Fire Breathers, an elite responder unit originally created to reach the small towns of the Ash Heap and deal with the toxic conditions there, were the new frontline defenders. As the situation worsened, the Fire Breathers tried to seal the tunnel with explosives. In the end, they failed, leaving the way clear for the Scorched to continue flooding west. By 2097, the scorching of Appalachia was complete, and the surface would remain clear of all humans until Reclamation Day 2102. That concludes all the history I could find on Lewisburg and the Fallout universe, but, like I said before, Lewisburg is a real city in the real world with a history of its own. Lewisburg was established during the Revolutionary War by the Virginia General Assembly in 1782, but the history of human occupation of the area stretches back potentially 12,500 years. For those of you who've watched my other videos on the cities of Appalachia, you know that I've spoken of the peoples of the Hopewell culture, occupying the areas where these cities are currently located. The Hopewell cultures were composed of different groups that all shared an interconnected trade network back to the first century BC. This may be the first city I've covered that is not within the region that was covered by that trade network. While I have generally put the earliest stage of human settlement at about the time of the Hopewell cultures, there were those who came before them. But just as we know so little of the Hopewell cultures, we know even less about those previous cultures. This is in part due to how old those cultures were, but is also due to the technology they had available to them. For example, ceramic pottery appears to have existed in this area only since around 1000 BC, which by the way is way later than it existed elsewhere, and it really makes me interested in the spread of technology and why some areas were so slow to make the same leaps that others made. But I digress. We know of the Hopewell thanks to their burial mounds, but the previous cultures appear to have buried their dead in shallow graves. The main artifacts we have from the time before the Hopewell were their arrowheads. Moving ahead to the era of European exploration and colonization, the native tribes occupying the area in the mid-18th century were the Shawnee and the Cherokee, who used the area as a hunting ground, although the Iroquois Confederacy claimed the area as well. The European history of the area in this case directly is connected to the name of the city, as one of the first settlers of the area was Andrew Lewis. Andrew Lewis was part of a prominent family in the history of Western Virginia, and thus there are many accounts of his life, even a fake diary originally attributed to his mother until it was outed as a fraud. I say this because I've tried to put together a concise history of his life, but there are dates and events in conflict in these different accounts, so keep that in mind. Andrew Lewis was born in 1720 in County Donegal, Ireland, a descendant of Huguenot refugees that fled persecution in France in the 17th century. In 1728, the local landlord, Sir Mungo Campbell, attempted to coerce inflated rent from his tenants. Andrew's father, John Lewis, refused to pay. 
This led the landlord to attack the tenants in an effort to evict them. Though Andrew's mother was injured in this attack and his uncle killed, his father managed to kill the landlord. This is where the story splits in two potential directions, but regardless of what happened in the interim, it appears that by 1732 the Lewis family was settled in Augusta County, Virginia. Originally, the colonies theoretically ran from sea to sea, and Augusta Colony stretched from its current position in the state of Virginia all the way through modern West Virginia and Kentucky. Through his youth, Andrew worked as a surveyor, working with his father to survey much of modern Greenbrier County. In 1751, Andrew Lewis established a camp near present-day Lewisburg Courthouse. When the French and Indian War broke out in 1754, the Ohio River became the frontier between the French-controlled Ohio Territory and the British 13 colonies. Virginia raised a militia to defend the frontier from native raids, and Lewis was made a captain in Lieutenant Colonel George Washington's regiment. Following their defeat to the French at Fort Necessity, Lewis was part of the colonial forces that escaped back across the Appalachians. Lewis was then made part of an effort to build a series of frontier forts before being allowed to return to the Greenbrier County area. In February 1756, Lewis led a force of militiamen and Cherokee allies to raid the Shawnee settlements along the Big Sandy and Ohio Rivers in revenge for the Shawnee attacks on the Virginia frontier. In 1758, he was part of the Forbes Expedition, a successful British advance over the mountains that just so happened to coincide with the signing of the Treaty of Easton that resulted in the natives switching to the British side and isolating the French. Unfortunately for Lewis, he was part of a force that attacked Fort Duquesne just before the treaty led the French to evacuate, and he was captured. Lewis spent the next year as a prisoner in Quebec. In 1763, as the Seven Years' War ended, Pontiac's Rebellion broke out. As part of the new British vs. Native War, the Shawnee raided settlements in Greenbrier County. A Shawnee chief named Cornstalk led 60 men to the settlement of Muddy Creek. He gained the settlers' confidence, and once their guard was down, the Shawnee slaughtered them. He repeated this at a small settlement near modern Lewisburg. In 1768, the British signed the Treaty of Fort Stanwix with the Iroquois Confederacy, with the Iroquois yielding modern West Virginia to the British. The Shawnee were not parties to this agreement, though, and continued to hunt in the area and fight colonial expansion. In 1769, Botetourt County was split off from Augusta County, Lewis's family's home county, and he was elected to the House of Burgesses, the first of two legislative positions he would hold until 1780. In 1770, Fort Savannah was established at the same spring upon which Lewis set his camp back in 1751. In 1774, Virginia Governor Dunmore, fed up with the Shawnee raids, planned an attack on the Shawnee homeland in the Ohio Territory. He led a force northwest to Fort Pitt, while he sent Lewis on a southern tract, which eventually led to his camping at the Ohio River at the mouth of the Kanawha River. Those who watched my Point Pleasant video will recognize this as the point that the Battle of Point Pleasant took place. On October 10, 1774, Lewis with his 1,000 militiamen held off three to 500 Shawnee warriors under Chief Cornstalk. Nine days later, Governor Dunmore and Lewis met with Chief Cornstalk and signed the Treaty of Camp Charlotte, in which the Shawnee yielded the land south of the Ohio River to Virginia. Though Dunmore and Lewis would depart the Ohio and return over the Appalachians as allies, it would not last. In 1775, as the revolution broke out, Dunmore suspended the House of Burgesses. Andrew and his brother Thomas Lewis became delegates to the new Provisional Rebel Congress. Andrew joined the Continental Army, with George Washington requesting that he be made a Brigadier General. He was passed over in favor of Charles Lee, as Congress believed at the time that each state should only field one Brigadier General. Lewis eventually received his promotion to Brigadier General in March of 1776, overseeing the defense of Virginia and the recruitment of additional soldiers. As a side note, Charles Lee was captured in December of that same year by Tarleton's Raiders. In 1776, Lewis was also one of the seven trustees of Liberty Hall, just renamed from Augusta Academy. Another side note, the school would be renamed three more times, Washington Academy in 1796, Washington College in 1813, and finally, Washington and Lee University in 1870, following the death of its president and former Confederate General Robert E. Lee. On July 9, 1776, Lewis led Virginian forces against his former boss, Royal Governor Lord Dunmore. Lord Dunmore had retreated to a small fortified island in the Chesapeake Bay. Though the Virginians were victorious, the governor escaped. The next year, with ailing health and accusations of treason in letting Lord Dunmore escape to the Caribbean, Lewis resigned his commission. In May of 1778, the Shawnee, in violation of the Treaty of Camp Charlotte, sent a raid into Virginia. One of these raids ran all the way to Fort Donnelly, just over 10 miles north of modern Lewisburg. Dick Pointer, a slave at the fort, managed to keep the raiders at bay until the settlers were roused. A Battle of Point Pleasant veteran and Andrew Lewis's nephew by marriage, Colonel John Stewart rushed forces from Fort Savannah to Fort Donnelly, lifting the siege. For his efforts, Mr. Pointer was granted his freedom in 1801, had a cabin built for him by locals, and was buried with full military honors in 1827 in a grave in Lewisburg. On October 20th, 1778, Greenbrier County was established by the Revolutionary Government. 
Though out of the army, Andrew Lewis remained an active part of the legislature and was appointed to the executive council by Governor Thomas Jefferson in 1780. Also in 1780, the streets of Lewisburg were laid out by Matthew Arbuckle Sr., a frontiersman who had led Lewis over the Appalachians in 1774. Both Arbuckle and Lewis died the following year. While on the job of building a route from Lewisburg to Warm Springs, Arbuckle was killed when a tree fell on him in a storm. Lewis was traveling home in 1781 when he fell ill and died in Bedford County, Virginia. Though buried in the family plot, Lewis was disinterred and reburied in Salem, Virginia in 1887. 1781 was the year a Presbyterian church was established in Lewisburg by Reverend John McHugh and Reverend Ben Brigsby. The church burned in 1796, but was replaced with the structure now known as the Old Stone Presbyterian Church that lies on Church Street. In 1782, the city was incorporated by the Virginia General Assembly and served as the site for many courts of Western Virginia. The first school in Lewisburg was established in 1808 by Presbyterian minister John Michelinie and his wife Rebecca Walkup. The school started in their living room, but by 1812 it moved into a brick schoolhouse serving men and women. In 1858, the Greenbrier Resort, the real-world inspiration for the White Spring Resort, was built southwest of nearby White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. In 1860, the census registered 969 people living in Lewisburg. When the Civil War began in 1861, Greenbrier County voted in favor of secession from the Union. Through the war, the county would provide 2,000 men to the Confederacy. On May 3, 1862, Union Colonel George Crook took control of Lewisburg from the Confederate cavalry in the Battle of Lewisburg. Ninety-five of the Confederate dead were buried in a cross-shaped mass grave just west of town. The city remained in Union hands after that point and was joined to West Virginia without a vote in 1863. In 1870, the population of Lewisburg had fallen to 875, before surpassing the 1860 census tally in 1880 with 985. In 1884, the first organized golf course in the United States opened at the Greenbrier Resort. The population of Lewisburg rose again to 1,016 in the 1890 census, and then fell for the next two subsequent censuses, landing in 1803 and 1910. In 1902, Andrew Carnegie provided $26,750 to build the Carnegie Hall as part of the Lewisburg Female Institute, requesting that the local population contribute $10,000 of their own funds to the effort. Though the Lewisburg Female Institute closed in 1972, the structure has been maintained and renovated and is still in use today. In 1906, the Meadow River Lumber Mill opened in 22 miles distant Raynell, West Virginia, the largest hardwood lumber mill of its kind. It produced enormous quantities of lumber until 1975. After the population fall from 1890 to 1910, the population grew every census from then on, which is substantial considering the story of population decline in almost every city I've covered so far. During the Great Depression, there are civilian conservation corps camps on the Greenbrier River, part of which flows past Lewisburg to its southeast. During World War II, the Greenbrier Resort served as an internment camp for Axis diplomats and a hospital for the wounded. During the Cold War, the Greenbrier was contracted by the United States government to construct a congressional bunker under the codename Project Greek Island. The resort covered this by constructing a new wing over the bunker, finding ways to hide the removed material, and making part of the bunker hide in plain sight as though it was just a normal part of the hotel. The bunker was in operation until it was revealed by the Washington Post in 1992 and subsequently decommissioned. In 2016, Greenbrier County was hit hard by flooding, suffering 16 casualties. The estimated population of Lewisburg in 2018 was 3,831, just one person more than the 2010 census figure. And that just about does it for what I found on Lewisburg and the surrounding Greenbrier County. This has been the Risley Cartographer. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you want notifications on when I release these lore videos, hit the notification bell or follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. If you have any comments or questions, leave them for me and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.